now I'll start. I'm Christina DaCosta, SAGE's Senior Director of Communications, and I am thrilled to be moderating this talkback and Q&A of the award-winning documentary, Cured. Cured has been described as a fascinating, riveting, and it's one of the best documentaries of this or any year. It was also the winner of the Audience Favorite Award at Newfest and Frameline. This essential documentary takes viewers inside the David versus Goliath battle that led the American Psychiatric Association to remove homosexuality from its Manual of Mental Illnesses in 1973. The film spotlights a diverse group of activists who achieved this epic victory in the movement for LGBT equality. We are again thrilled to have this a uh, great panel here today with us. Um, among our panelists is Patrick Salmon. Patrick is the co-producer and co-director of Cured. A resident of Washington, DC, he previously served as creator and executive producer of Codebreaker, an award-winning doc drama documentary about the life legacy of gay British codebreaker, Alan Turing, that reached more than 3 million viewers worldwide. Welcome, Patrick. We are also pleased to have Bennett Singer. Bennett is a Los Angeles-based filmmaker and the other co-director and co-producer of Cured. Bennett's previously credits include co-directing Electoral Dysfunction, an award-winning, do you sense a theme, award-winning everyone? Award-winning film on voting rights and Brother Outsider, a documentary portrait of the gay civil rights activist Bayard Rustin that premiered at Sundance and won more than 20 international prizes, including the GLAAD Media Award. Welcome to Bennett. And we are also thrilled to have one of my personal favorites, a sage elder, Reverend Goddess Magora Kennedy, as a part of our panel and as she's featured in the documentary. The Reverend has been fighting for social justice for more than five decades. An active participant in the civil rights movement, the women's movement, and the movement for LGBTQ equality, she is an original member of the Black Panther Party who describes herself as the gayest great-great-grandmother out of the closet you'll ever meet. And that's for reals, because I've met her. A uh, resident of New York City, she is a Stonewall veteran who is also working on a book called Shades of Stonewall. Reverend Kennedy is also featured in a new exhibit and book called Not Another Second, which tells the story of 12 LGBT elders. Big, big welcomes to Reverend. And last but not least, we'd like to thank our sponsors at AARP New York for supporting our work and this fabulous event and other events during Pride. Nicolette, Nicolette Okasin, AARP New York ambassador, would like to share a few words. Nicolette. Thank you, Christina. And hello, everyone. Um, on behalf of ARP New York, welcome to today's uh, SAGE um, uh, Strong Virtual Event. ARP New York has teamed up with SAGE to present this Q&A with talent from the documentary Cured. This event is one of the series of Pride-related community activities ARP is supporting to celebrate Pride Month. ARP is the nation's largest nonprofit, nonpartisan organization dedicated to empowering Americans 50 and older to choose how to live as they age. ARP works to strengthen communities and advocate for whatever, ma uh, whatever matters most to families with a focus of health security, financial stability, and personal fulfillment. We collaborated with SAGE earlier this year on a uh, report uh, highlighting disparities older for LGBTQ New Yorkers face and recommending so, sorry. Okay, so recommending the LGBTQ for older, older New York. Um, and SAGE uh, for New York, uh, the aging development. Uh, just one moment, okay. Sorry, I'm having camera issues, so I apologize. <laughs> okay, we offer information and resources for New Yorkers uh, aged 50 and their families in our website or via virtual programs. Like this one, like this one that you enjoy can comfort of your home. From cooking workshops, uh, we offer offer free movies and live virtual concerts to family caregiving advice, volunteering opportunities, and more ARP New York is here for you. To learn about what we are doing in your community, connect with ARP.org uh, and uh, backslash near you, okay? And thank you, and please enjoy the presentation. Back to you, Christina. 
Thank you, Nicolette. Um, so I'm very excited to start our actual Q&A portion of, of today's panel and event. Um, so I hope I can be seen on the screen with Bennett and Patrick and the amazing Reverend Goddess. So um, my first question is going to be for Patrick. So Patrick, what was the catalyst for Cured? And why did you want to tell this story out of all of the stories? Well, Christine, I appreciate the question. You probably thought this day would never come. I think we must have contacted you four years ago with our film in progress and we would disappear for six months at a time, but you and your colleagues never lost faith. So the, the partnership with SAGE has been really wonderful and it's exciting to, to present this here uh, to your members and allies and as well to team up with AARP New York, which is also another of our favorite organizations. We're, partnering with AARP to present a, 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 a number of screenings around the country uh, later this summer. So we're big fans of both SAGE and AARP and are excited to be here today to talk about the film. And uh, this really uh, started with an idea back in the fall of 2014. Uh, I have a friend in Washington who's head of the Mattachine Society of Washington, D.C., that was the group uh, Frank Kameny started in the 50s. Well, it was reborn about 10 years ago as an LGBT history organization. And my friend Charles Francis, who runs that organization, wrote a film script about the life of Frank Kameny, who's one of the heroes in the film. And Frank, uh, you know, he took part in this panel discussion, uh, which there's a photo behind me, with Dr. Anonymous in 1972 at the APA annual meeting. And my friend's film script told this story and it sort of jumped off the pages at me as an amazing idea for a documentary. In this moment in 1972, a psychiatrist by the name of Dr. John Fryer was forced to uh, wear a mask, uh, actually a distorted Richard Nixon mask in order to testify to his colleagues about what it was like to be a gay psychiatrist. And I was familiar with this APA fight, but this sort of brought it to me in a new light. And so I thought it would be a great documentary idea. And I uh, convinced my uh, friend Bennett Singer to join me on this Odyssey. We had met during the production of my last film, Codebreaker. He was a, Bennett was a consulting producer on that one. And so we got started in the uh, spring of 2015 doing our first interviews. And it, we really, our priority was to interview as many people as possible because we knew that the storytellers in the film were at an advanced age. And so that was our, our priority. And we weren't really sure how many people were still around who were involved in the fight. And it was uh, such a pleasure to be able to interview so many people like Reverend Kennedy to get their recollections. And that's really the, the heart of the film. And at its core, though, this moment was is so critical in the history of the, uh, of the LGBT equality movement, because as long as we were classified as mentally ill in business and government, we're going to use that as an excuse to discriminate. So this really had to be the first domino to fall in this fight for equality. Much, Patrick. That's uh, it, it has been a while, and I'm glad that I'm still here to to see it come to fruition and and all of all of its great successes, um, which which is phenomenal. Um, my next question is actually for the Reverend. Um, I know this from watching the film, but also just from your own personal stories um, that your your mother and you've spoken about this quite a bit was so troubled about the idea of having a lesbian for a daughter that she gave you the choice to either go to a mental institution or get married at the age of 14. Um, was it even legal to get married at that point? And what was it like facing that kind of choice from your own mother and family? Well, um, uh, uh, the legality, I don't know, but I do know that parents always had to say so over their children. And what was happening for us upstate, uh, I was born in Albany, New York, and raised up in Saratoga Springs. Saratoga has a lot of history, you know, and uh, July and August is the racing season when thoroughbred uh, racing, uh, people come to, to the racetrack to see these thoroughbred horses from all over the country and whatnot. So during July and August, you know, uh, Saratoga is really, really big. Uh, after the racing season is over and into the fall, it goes back to being a little small town that it was. My mother always said, come to me with whatever you have and uh, you can tell me anything. So I did. I told her, you know, my little fantasies that I had, my little girlfriends and whatnot. 
And she never changed expression on her face, but she never said anything, whether it was right, wrong, or whatever, until the news started getting around Saratoga about me and the girls. And then that's when she said, uh, you're, you will get married or you will go to Utica. Now, Utica upstate is like Bellevue is here in New York. So with that kind of threatening, <laughs> you know, again, whether it was legal or illegal, parents always had to say so over their children up to the, at that time, now it's 21, but at that time, up to the age of 18. And so the whole thing was I, uh, my friends, uh, most of my, a lot of my friends, uh, they went in the convent to keep, uh, to keep them getting married. The guys went in the priesthood, they joined the service, they ran away from home, all kinds of things. So, you know, me, I tried to too. I ran away from home and went down to the recruiting station in Albany and took the test for the Air Force and passed it. And even though I had a certificate that said that I was older, you know, than 14. I got shipped to Waco, Texas. I was in the Air Force exactly two weeks. And then 14 days, and then there um, I was called into the commander's office, and there sat my mother with a private detective. And on the way back to Saratoga, she said, "You will get married," you know. And I was like, "Oh my gosh, what can I do?" Well, I had been in and out of New York City, going to these little storefront churches, and in this particular one, they was getting ready to put the minister out because he was not married. And so we struck a deal. So I called my mother, told her, "Oh, I'm in love with marrying a minister." And of course, you know, she was thrilled. June 7th, 1953, I got married. Well, uh, long story short, <laughs> although the marriage was consummated, it was annulled. And which I'm thinking, sure, say my mother was going to Saratoga County Jail. But again, upstate, uh, New York, any place else. And back in those days, parents really had to say so over their children. So they had a lot to do with, um, you know, as I said, whether you lived or died, you know, so that was... Uh, and through that, I had anger. I felt betrayed by my mother. And this is one of the reasons I was involved in the women's movement. Um, I was in the civil rights movement. I was up in Boston. I was on the radio. And I used to do gospel shows on Sunday. But the whole thing was that I just really felt, you know, I felt betrayed. So I went south um, on voter registration to help people in the south to vote, you know, to learn how to vote properly. And, and from that, into the women's movement. I was involved in the movement with uh, people like uh, Bella Abzug. And um, uh, I, I was just like really thrilled. Flo Kennedy was a black feminist attorney, uh, Gloria Steinem, people like that. So we were, you know, I was like forefront in the women's movement. I worked on Shirley Chisholm's campaign, who was the first black to announce presidency of the United States. I worked on her campaign. But the thing for me was when they assassinated Dr. Martin Luther King, that was the end of my nonviolence. That was the end of my whole, I just, you know, couldn't deal with it anymore. I met Stokely Carmichael and uh, I joined the Black Panther Party, me and two of my sons. So, and then from that, I heard about Stonewall as I was driving some of my in the closet friends up to P Town. That broke out on a Friday. And I let them out uh, near P-Town, put them in a taxi, gave the cab driver the money, and I drove back to New York uh, to Greenwich Village. I got in the fray on Saturday night with Sylvia Rivera. So, uh, you know, the whole thing is like, for me, comes full circle. Because it all started because Judy Garland had died. And they, uh, everybody had been in the Stonewall, all dressed up in their finery and real jewelry, and was going uptown to view Judy Garland at her wake. And when they got uptown, the heavens opened up and poured down thunder, lightning poured down rain, and everybody went back to the stone wall in soaking wet. And this was the time that one of the that the cops decided to pull one of their last famous raids uh, on the bars in Greenwich Village in New York. When they got into Stonewall, lo and behold, the cops were in there, and they used to carry these great big signs that said, "This is a raided premises." This football player used to come in from uh, California every weekend, dress up and drag, just to be out and open and go back to California on Monday. Uh, he got out of the stone wall and uh, Marsha P. Johnson, transgender, right behind them. She grabbed the sign and they ran out of stone wall and he grabbed the parking meter because they weren't cemented at those times. And he grabbed the parking meter, up, put that across the door so the cops inside could not get outside. Of course, in those days, all they had was those little walkie talkies. And by the time they called for backup, the word had spread around the village and the bars just emptied into the streets. And it so, was on. 
<laughs> it was I'm odd. <laughs> no, no, that's okay. This just leads me to um, a, a question that I wanted to ask, given like all of this talk of resistance and your, your, you know, refusing now to be invisible and silent, you know, in, in a very physical way. You know, one of the biggest moments I feel like in the film came when you confronted David Suskin on national television. And so could you walk us back to, to that aspect and that moment of resistance and like, what were you feeling and what led you to, you know, confront this then powerful person on television? Well, a lot. <laughs> my grandmother always used to say the, the um, the bigger you come, the harder you fall. <laughs> you know, so he uh, we, before we went on before we went on stage, um, he came sauntering through with his nose kind of like his nose up in the air, and so Barbara Giddings, Dr. Giddings was there with her group, and I was there with them. She extended her hand to David Suskind. David Suskind shook her hand and then grabbed the towel and wiped his hand after shaking her hand. So. She kind of turned red in the face and me, because the, the way homophobia was and racism was, he didn't even speak to me. He just looked me up and down and just kept walking. And I said to them, I said, don't worry, we're going to get him. I said, we're not going to let this pass. And sure enough, we got, when we went on camera, when we were on stage, he's going on and on about homosexuality and how marriage is between men and women. And finally, I couldn't take it anymore. And of course, me being the country preacher that I was from upstate, in those days, they didn't have the microphones as much. So um, I reached across my sister who's sitting beside me, and I said, does it really make you feel good to feel proud about what's that guy with? And he jumped and dropped all his papers and got completely, as I say, discombobulated. And Barbara Gennings and all of us, we laughed our behinds off of him. He could never get, he could never recover. They went to break and they went back on, but yet and still, he, he <laughs> He was flustered. And we said, and I said, see, gotcha. <laughs> so this actually leads me to a question for Bennett, because, you know, this is part of uh, archival footage that was 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 featured in the film. Um, so how long, you know, what was that production process like and like trying to find these materials out there? Um, you know, how how long did it sort of take to compile this and like, you know, figure out your narrative? And what was your favorite discovery? Sure. Well, as Patrick said, I, I am also thrilled to be here, thrilled that the film is actually done and that we're all together for Pride. So thank you to you and AARP for making today's event happen. Um, it was about a five year odyssey and really at the heart of that was the search for archival materials. I'm sure you and the folks on this call will know that there is sort of a, a standard body of material that appears in many historical documentaries about the LGBTQ past, and that's understandable. You know, there is a finite body of material, but we were determined to see if we could expand that and go beyond it. And so we had two amazing archival producers who spent months, if not years, really scouring the globe in search of um, ways to help us tell the story and material for that. Um, and and they unearthed some footage and photos and documents that I don't think have really been seen for 50 years um, or even longer. One of the things we wanted to portray was the treatments that um, gay and lesbian people were subjected to. And so it's chilling, but you know, there is actual footage of a gay man who had undergone a lobotomy talking about that. Um, and that was a sort of a conversation in the editing room. Did we want to show it at all? And if we did show it, how much of the graphic aspect of this treatment could people take? You know, we didn't want to we didn't want to alienate our viewers, but at, at the same time, we wanted to respect and honor these survivors and the people who went through these treatments. And so we found what I hope is a middle ground, um, which portrays honestly what what people went through both visually and then you know there's footage uh, too of an interview with a man who talks about um being sent to a psychiatrist and 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 you know the psychiatrist telling him well we could castrate you but we'll try something a little less extreme electroshock therapy and so i think those moments especially from the point of view of the survivors are really invaluable um, and, and, and I'm so glad to have that testimony from archival sources. 
um, the, the Susskind episode was um, a huge discovery, and I don't think people have really seen that since 1971. It was a moment in television history, as well as LGBTQ history, because it was the very first time that out lesbians had ever been on American television. And it was quite a moment. And it was seeing that footage that led us to um, search out and, and connect with Reverend Kennedy. And we're so happy that, that we did, you know, make that connection. And then, you know, we learned about the story you were just discussing about that choice that your mother gave you, Reverend Kennedy, when you were 14 and, and how tied in directly that was to the DSM diagnosis. Similarly, there was a segment on 60 Minutes from 1973, which featured two of our storytellers, and we used a lot of that material and really were very happy to have a chance to see the activists as they existed in the 60s and 70s, and then juxtapose those you know, scenes with footage of a present day interview. And I think that's really moving to see both what has changed in 50 years, but also to see that there is a spark of activism and courage and self-confidence in our storytellers that, that really doesn't change and that remains very consistent and true. And then the last nugget I'll share is that we, we spent, you know, a lot of stuff is, are, is digitized and you could find it through internet searches, but not everything. And we learned that lesson when Patrick and I spent several days in Philadelphia going through the 217 boxes of materials that John Fryer's estate donated to the Historical Society of, of Pennsylvania, which is this amazing archive. And we, um, you know, there was one very intriguing box that had miscellaneous audio, a lot of unlabeled audio cassettes and sat there going through tape after tape. And miraculously enough, one of the tapes actually had the speech, the audio of that 1972 address where you know John Fryer in that picture behind Patrick was disguised as Dr. Anonymous and gave this really I think pivotal speech about I am a psychiatrist, I am a homosexual, I am a human being and I think no matter what celebrity we might have been able to recruit to recreate that moment nothing could have matched the authenticity and the power and the emotion of, of having the real thing and so that was a big discovery and you know I'm usually pretty well behaved in libraries, but at that moment I let out a bit of a yelp. <laughs> I'm so happy we, 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 we have that material as well as the other um, stuff that we found in order to bring this story to life. Yeah, I think I can infer my next question from what you just said, Bennett, but I'm curious from um, either your or Patrick's perspective, so either one feel free to jump in. You know, um, a lot of historical documentaries, right, have a narrator, there's that like, you know, sweeping Ken Burnsius stuff happening um, and cured really doesn't um, it doesn't have that and it doesn't really have the voices of like historians coming at you um, and so you know I just I'd love to hear your thought process and again I think you just said it but I'd love to hear it from either you or Patrick again um, why did you choose to tell this story without quote-unquote experts well, aside from any other achievement with the film, one of the things I'm most proud of is that Ben and I still are friends and talk to each other. <laughs> and the <laughs> filmmaking process can be, you know, it's very collaborative and we're in there with, with our editor for it took us about 10 months to edit the film. And um, we uh, started off, uh, you know, committed to telling the story without using a, a narrator, but we had intended to include some present day experts uh, we, at the very beginning of the production process, brought together a board of advisors, and they've been helpful throughout this process. These are uh, psychiatrists, people who are experts, the history of psychiatry, LGBT history, people who are experts on the, the, pre the history of conversion therapy. So we have this great group of, of people who've uh, offered advice and guidance and looked at cuts, and we interviewed several of them, but uh, I think the credit has to go to our um, our editor, Steve Hefner, who was so instrumental in, in creating the film that is today. As an aside, unfortunately, Steve passed away last month from, from cancer. And this film really is, is um, a testament to his talent and passion. And, you know, he uh, lobbied us and cajoled us and convinced us ultimately that we should just, um, we should let the, the experts who lived through it tell the story. People like Reverend Kennedy and the other uh, people we were able to interview 
And with the archival material that Bennett spoke of, it was um, excellent to be able to ha have that past uh, archival material with the present day recollections. And ultimately, the activists, one of their mantras when engaging with the psychiatrist was to sort of say to them, we are the experts on our lives. Let us listen to us. Don't just um, rely on bad science. So we are the experts on our lives. And so at the end of the day, we let those experts guide us through the telling of this film. Yes, I'm sharing um, evidence to that point about the slogan. And I, I just, yeah, I think ultimately, as Patrick said, we, we felt that we did have the experts, i.e. the people who lived through these this this um, campaign and and um, to have historians in the mix would have made it, I think, less immediate, less authentic, less profoundly moving um, and more in, in sort of a sense of distance. And so I'm happy that Steve um, really did convince us to take that path and to allow the experts to speak from their first person point of view. Oh, I'm sorry to hear about your your loss and uh, thank you. To it's Steve pretty for... devastating, but yeah, as Patrick said, like he poured his soul into this film, and it will be dedicated to him when it airs on PBS. And we're we're still, you know, coping with that. But I think he would be very happy that events like this are happening, and that the his work and the story is reaching millions of people. Well, I will turn it over to one of our experts, um, Reverend. Um, you know, I, uh, I admire you so much because you've, you've been fighting for a long time and you still have a smile on your face and you're, you're still fighting for so many things. And, you know, I feel, you know, as someone who's been fighting not only for LGBT equality, but for racial justice, for women's equality, um, what lessons do you think we can draw from the film about the process of bringing about lasting social change? You know, as Patrick said, this was sort of, you know, the, the first, a, a bit of a catalyst, right? You know, Stonewall was definitely a catalyst, but moving to, you know, making sure that homosexuality was no longer a mental disorder. Um, how, what are these lessons that that you'd like, you know, folks who are on this uh, listening in today, but you know, for the future, since we're recording this, um, what are your what are your feelings on how, you know how we can make lasting social change? One of the things that I always say, and I especially say to young people, the lessons I hope people will understand and get is that first of all, we are all human beings. And I always say, you know, we're spiritual beings having a human experience. So, but the thing is to love your children, love people where they are, learn tolerance, learn that, you know, everybody is yet there. Everybody might have two eyes and nose and a mouth, but we are all different. And yet the biggest thing that I say, especially to the young people is love yourself, live your truth, and laugh in the face of adversity. Stay focused and don't let nobody turn you around because it is important in this day and time as it was back there then uh, in 69. It is important that we now fight this, oh my God, every time I think about conversion therapy and Bennett had alluded to that there were 30 states you know, that still had uh, conversion therapy uh, on their books. And now we got one less because on June 15th, the, mis the governor of Michigan uh, signed a law banning conversion therapy. And I'd like to think, personally, I'd like to think that uh, we had cured, we helped because we was in Michigan uh, doing a virtual uh, at some school or something out there uh, before the governor signed this. So, you know, so if that's what it takes, then if we have to even go back to the streets, that's what it's going to take to get rid of conversion therapy. That's what we got to do. You know, we got to fight for our transgendered brothers and sisters and, uh, and people of color. And the fact that transgendered, um, transgendered uh, Blacks and people of color get murdered more than transgendered uh, white people do. And it's unfortunate, but this is the fight and the struggle continues. So I'm hoping that people will take away from this and learn the lesson, talk to their, um, to their uh, different, uh, you know, Congress people, whoever they have to talk to, to get 
conversion therapy off the records and out of the states. You're here um, for that. <laughs> and, amen, you know, right to, uh, amen, girl, and to pass the Equality Act. So if you haven't mm -hmm. called your senators yet, uh, please do so. Uh, I can put a link in the chat later. Um, okay. But this this actually leads me something for Patrick. Um, you know, as the Reverend just stated, and the film makes clear, right? And as we all know, even though it's Pride Month, you know, it's not just one month, right? The fight for mm. equality continues 365 days a year. Um, and, you know, it's these practices as conversion therapy, trans bathroom bills, et cetera. Um, you know, I, from your perspective, as you know, one of the co-filmmakers and seeing all these, you know, lines and pieces, puzzle pieces together, you know, how do the events that you've seen in the film connect to the establishment of these current harmful practices? Yeah, it really gets to the the root, the root of what we see, the as Reverend Kennedy was talking about, the ongoing use of conversion therapy has its roots to this fight. In fact, in the spring of 1974, right after the APA membership had voted to affirm what the board of trustees had decided, you had the first a creation of ex-gay organizations, this conversion therapy movement, starting with Love in Action and Exodus and all these organizations that did, did so much harm to LGBT people. And, you know, people like Dr. Charles Socarides and Dr. Bieber realized in the spring of 74 that they could no longer hide behind the APA as a sort of um, seal of approval with their conversion therapy efforts. And so they had to, um, you know, this industry is, is established. And it really, as all of us know, the harm it's done in terms of the emotional damage and the increased rates of suicide. And, you know, one of the positive parts of this, though, is that the medical establishment is on our side now, whereas before this period in 1973, they, of course, were our opponents. And I know there still needs to be more progress within the mental health profession in terms of how LGBT people are treated. But in general, as a, as a profession, and particularly the APA, uh, now led by an openly gay psychiatrist, Dr. Saul Levin, which is a, a real sign of the, the, the progress that's been made. And the APA and the AMA and other medical organizations have publicly spoke out against conversion therapy and are, are part of the um, you know, the organizations pushing to have it um, a ban, particularly among minors, as, as all those states uh, still allow it. So uh, we hope this film can be uh, part of the effort, the education effort that's going on. We had an event uh, last week in Nebraska with a state lawmaker out there who's trying to, to push a conversion therapy ban and our education and outreach campaign with the support of organizations like AARP and the APA Foundation and the AIDS Healthcare Foundation. And Gilead is allowing us to partner with organizations and, and have screenings and conversations like this. And uh, we hope that it can be a real uh, tool to shine a spotlight on the history so that it can give context to people about the ongoing debate about this issue. Thank you. Well, definitely is a is a tool, um, and and I hope that it will be used widely uh, from all groups. And I think it's a really powerful testament to show lawmakers um, and policymakers across the board um, of the consequences. Um, so, you know, again, great job, guys. Um, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, Bennett, I'd love to ask you, um, you know, given, and I love your saying, like, normally you're well behaved, but you geeked out. Um, Sorry. Uh, no, no, I, I mean, you know, when you get excited, it won't happen you get, again. You get excited. Um, you know, along the lines of, you know, searching for this material, interviewing these amazing people like Reverend Kennedy. Um, you know, I'd love to hear, you know, what impact did, did having all of this have on you as both a filmmaker and as Reverend Kennedy says, a human being? Mm. Well, I think it, it, it really gave me this ongoing sense of inspiration, um, you know, because before there was really even a full-fledged movement for gay rights, people like Frank Kameny and Barbara Giddings and Reverend Kennedy were out there demanding equality. And really that, self, that sense of self-confidence that they all embodied 
at a time when all the experts, including David Susskind, you know, so smug and so certain and so sure about the truth, you know, and claiming even that science backed it up, there was this sense of, of self-confidence and self-knowledge and self-awareness that, that, you know, I, I understand, but working on this project helped me fully embrace that and, and hopefully um, embody it in some ways myself as a gay man. And, you know, I, 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 I like to think that I found a whole new group of heroes and role models and people who, whose courage and bravery and, and achievements are so inspiring. So it was really an honor to, to, to connect and meet with, you know, meet such pioneers. And, um, you know, I think we've already said it, but several of them, of our storytellers, I think five of the people we've interviewed have, have since died. And, and so I do think, you know, it's great for the historical record that we have these long interviews with them. <laughs> <laughs> a fraction of which has ended up in the film, but the, you know, ultimately the footage will, will be shared in some public way, I hope, and, and for other researchers and for the historical record. Um, and then just, you know, understanding and, and, and connecting with experiencing that sense of courage and, and activism is, is really a, a shot in the arm for me. So I feel very lucky to uh, have had that experience. Literally why I work at Sage every day. Um, I can imagine, yes. It's, <laughs> it's, it's built into your job and all oh, the yeah. bureau it's, it's, bureaucracy or the, the daily, you know, struggles fade away. And of course, we had our own share of like fundraising challenges. And But it's true at the end of the day, the five years were well spent, I would argue, because we have this, you know, Product body of work is, yeah yeah and that, that it, we, we we know is reaching people and, and bringing people together in such a powerful way and you and patrick are still friends i mean that's great <laughs> that's the uh, official line <laughs> <laughs> like that's what we say at the panel i'm kidding uh, um, no, it's so been I a great collaboration so yeah i definitely <laughs> want to leave time for q a since we already have a couple but i'm going to ask one more round robin and then we'll open it up to everyone uh, who's been asking questions so for each of you in just a couple of words if you can um, what lessons do you hope that viewers will take away from the film? And I'll start with you, Patrick. I just think that um, that change is possible. You know, the, the resilience that these activists showed going up against this formidable institution that seemed uh, apparently, you know, it was really a David, David versus Goliath battle. Probably 95% of APA members, we were told by experts, would have thought that this was a mental illness. And that didn't deter the activists. It didn't deter the people from within the APA to push for change. So I think that's a message all of us can reflect on today. And, and Ben had talked about inspiration, certainly be inspired by that dedication to push forward and press forward and fight and try to overcome this apparently insurmountable obstacle. And I know in today's world and a variety of social change movements, you could have the same situation and you just need to press on one step in front of the other and and figure out what you can do to help advance advance the fight forward. Great. Bennett, how about you? Well, I would add to that that I think, you know, one really central um, reason for the change was the role that allies played. And um, without support from people whose lives may not have been personally affected by this diagnosis, and they could have easily just abstained or turned the page or walked away, but they actually engaged with this issue. They listened to the activists, they changed their minds um, and, and became enlightened. So that sense of allies and, and the difference they can make um, has really struck me. And, and I think it's another lesson that can really um, be so empowering for other social change movements. That's great. Um, and Reverend, Last but certainly not least, what about you? Uh, well, what I say like that, <laughs> um, we are the Davids and the Goliath is the, you know, this conversion therapy thing. And so uh, conversion therapy being the elephant and us being the mice, how does the mouse eat an elephant? One bite at a time. We're gonna take down these next uh, 30 states and get uh, conversion therapy banned. Even if we have to take it back to the streets. 
bite, bite, bite. <laughs> um, excellent. Well, thank you all so, so much. We have a couple of questions in the chat that I'm going to um, take a look at. Um, uh, thank you, Patricia. Uh, Patricia, uh, you could all read the chat as well, but um, really kind words. And if you have a question you want to ask, please do. Um, Bill had asked, um, interesting, I think maybe we'd be caught on this, but but maybe not. So uh, I learned so much about my history. I would ask, what advice would you give to the conservative churches still fighting LGBT, GLBT as a sin? Seems like we've been fighting this now for 30 plus years. I know things move slow. What did you learn that you would not advise? So the opposite of what I just asked. So what's a tactic that you were like, this is not working? Reverend, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, one of the things that I can say that uh, when I, I, I always say, you know, being a spiritualist and into spirituality, I said there was a spirit going through the universe at the time of the uprising 1969. Because out on the West Coast, Reverend Troy D. Perry was starting Metropolitan Community Church, and which grew all around the country. Um, uh, Reverend Perry uh, later ordained Bishop Carl Bean, who started um, Unity Fellowship Churches. And so there was an answer. You know, there was always there was the gay Catholic that had their own group. Gay Episcopalians had their group. Um, the Jewish uh, people had their group. So uh, people that had a faith or a belief in a higher power, we knew we were OK. But the thing is getting it out to the regular church as well to that um, um, to today, there are affirming churches that accept the uh, gay and lesbian people as they are. You know, so um, things are changing. We still have a long way to go. Do not give up faith and let nobody turn you around. All well said. Um, there's a, a, a question here by Margie, who is actually an APA member, uh, but not till the later 70s, and, and they do know the history. Um, and they have the ability to listen to a panel with APA tomorrow. Are y'all going to be on that panel or is it a different one? Um, I will be on that one, but it'll be different. Uh, aside from that, it'll be more focused on the, the history of psychiatry. So tune in to that one as well. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Patrick. Margie, I hope you got your answer. Um, and uh, they also followed up with, I assumed you started too late to actually meet John Fryer, but wasn't he an amazing chronicler? Bennett? Indeed, we did not have the chance to meet him in person, but we did read through his diaries and, um, <laughs> you know, which he was in terms of chronicling, that was such a great source. And um, there's one diary entry in, that we quoted in the film where he, after he gave that speech, he aboard his Allegheny Airlines flight back to Philadelphia, he's writing his reflections and he says something like, for the first time in my life, I have aligned myself with a force that is akin to my humanity. I'm paraphrasing, but basically he's saying that he has really identified himself with the gay community. And I think that was such a breakthrough for him and so moving. And um, I'll also say, as we may have mentioned, um, but but the, the documentary has recently actually been optioned as the basis for a scripted series um, on FX or Hulu. And it's in the early stages and, you know, not, not, not a sure thing, but if it does happen, one of the things that I think will be really, really powerful would be to expand the character of John Fryer because we, you know, we had like two lines from a radio interview. We did have the diary entries and the written materials, but, but to flesh him out and to really understand who this man was and the, the process he went through to, to put on that mask and how he felt and how it changed his life and what the risks he was taking were. I think that could all be really great as an yeah. you know, adaptation of the documentary. Element. There are so, still other gay psychiatrists alive who didn't know him. So those are the people that can give you some of the direct quotes. I had my now 27 year old in an umbrella stroller at a party in his house wow. with a gay and lesbian psychiatrist. So that will always be my picture, even though he lived a good 20 years after that. Um, just that a baby was in an umbrella stroller in his house. 
Uh, we've heard legends about that house and his dogs and just he, he was such a larger than life figure. So yes, we, we would hope to portray all of that character in the, you know, the fictional version or the scripted adaptation. And I, I agree that, you know, he deserves much more, uh, you know, fuller, a, a fuller portrayal. And, and it's, I'm hoping that we'll be able to do that. Well, good luck with that series. Uh, I'd definitely watch it. Sounds amazing. My fingers and toes are crossed. And thank you, Margie, for your questions and insights. Uh, super, um, super fascinating sometimes the way worlds collide. Um, we have another, gr actually a great question um, from Bill. The title cured is both simple, powerful, and impactful. I will remember once APA voted. There was a cure for so many. Any other titles considered? Actually, no, that was the, the first out of the, <laughs> out of the gate. It was like the first moment, the idea, I think uh, it was really, um, it was so perfect for what story we were telling and the impact it had on the idea of sort of um, cured as a, as a people, if you will, by this organization. But uh, yeah, so we, um, but also, you know, the, the view, the impact this had on people's psyche of the generation, and that was one of the things you know we we knew about. But talking to the to the the people who were there, I, Ron Gold in particular, I remember here's someone who's involved in the gay liberation movement is out there on the front lines, and even he's talked about how this sort of mental illness label felt like there was something wrong with him for wanting to to have to be in love with another man. So that sort of notion of being being cured. I'm sure Bennett, you have some insights as well. I'll just, I agree that it um, was the perfect title, unlike with some of my other projects where the title could be such a struggle and you're thinking is, you know, like what could possibly fit and encapsulate the whole arc of the story. Um, Cured was pretty perfect and uh, Patrick gets the credit. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, it's funny you say that because we actually, um, I was talking with another Sage spokesperson who's uh, on the younger side of old, we like to say, um, and he remembers being at uh, his his folks' house with his gay godfather, who, when the news came out, he was like, "I'm cured, great, cool, like this happened," you know, and so it just made me think like that is the perfect title, like you just nailed it, um, hundred um, percent. Two, two more questions. One's from James. Um, is conversion therapy still allowed in North Carolina? Do y'all know? It is. That's one of the states where there are efforts to, um, to ban the practice. Well, as the Reverend Kennedy said, let's keep biting that elephant and see what we can do in North Carolina. Um, thank you, Bennett. Uh, Sasha asks, what was the most unique or surprising source that you used to inform the film? That is a great question. Um, we've done about 50 or 60 of these virtual events, so credit to Sasha for asking something we, we haven't been asked. It's, um, you know, there's so many little nuggets along the way that we found, and I think um, credit to the um, APA for opening their archives and, and helping us tell the story with the visual elements and documents. You know, at the start of this, Bennett described, we're trying to pitch a film and we're telling people that we're going to make a a documentary about conferences and meetings. It's kind of a, a challenging thing to describe. But for me, one of my favorite nuggets of archival material is the um, the ballot. Uh, you know, near the end of the film, we have a shot of the ballot that APA members use to vote on whether to affirm or reject the board of trustees decision. And to geek out a second as a filmmaker, it was like a two year search for that ballot. And, you know, the APA archivist was leading the hunt for us. And we obviously we could have made the film without the ballot, but just seeing the ballot is just a nice little element. And as you look back, you know, as we Ben and I look back through the film, there's sort of a story behind every one of those you know, those pieces, like there's the 19, there's the meeting, you know, the, the Frank Kameny behind the podium uh, screaming at the psychiatrist and there are photos and we didn't know those photos existed. And our archival producer, one of them, Luann Jones, who works so well with, with Purdue Chandra to, to discover all these amazing visual elements, got 1500 photographs digitally from Time Life magazine and they were unlabeled and unmarked. And so we're scouring through these and I recognize this event because we'd read so much about it 
Omnishorum, I think, is are the shorums on the uh, the podium. And so that was like another discovery, but it's sort of like a scavenger hunt and you're not expecting it. And often things historically aren't filed well. And it's been a real um, fun adventure to uncover these nuggets. And I would just add, you know, also we, we wanted to give the context for the what was happening sort of more broadly in society during the struggle. And so there's a short, but I think very revealing section about pop culture and the fact that like All in the Family had an episode dealing with a gay friend of Archie Bunker and the Mary Tyler Moore show and then the very first made for TV movie of the week that talked about um, homosexuality and actually has a, a scene about, you know, they say the, the, the main character talks about um, experts arguing that if you're gay, you need to be cured. And so seeing that actual, you know, the way that this issue permeated pop culture, both specifically in the case of that conversation in that movie, but even more broadly in, in the, broad, the broader context, that was, you know, kind of surprising. And I think helpful in terms of giving people a broader canvas for why this all matters and how people were perceiving gay people. And that's all juxtaposed with the opening where you have this chilling lecture of 19, I think 1962, where the chief of police in Dade County, Florida is talking to middle school students and saying, if we catch you, you know, being gay or with a gay person, we will, you know, make the rest of your life a living hell. And just that context. Um, and 62 was obviously not that long before 72. And so I think situating the, the social context and the sort of political and cultural uh, environment was 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 important and, and I'm glad we were able to turn up some ways to do that through film footage. Great question, Sasha. Thank you, Patrick and Bennett. Um, we're, uh, we're about five minutes out and so I definitely want to open it up if there are any other questions, if somebody wants to raise their hand. And, oh, I see you, Marilyn. Feel free to unmute. Or Sasha, can you help Marilyn on mute? I got it. Oh, good. Uh, oh, good. I, I think the film, I'm a, uh, I love film. Uh, I'm a consumer of film. I'm a consumer of psychotherapy. I'm a senior elder. I've been out in the community for many years. This is really, was an incredible film, I thought. And I'm so sorry to hear that that, was it Stephen who was the editor? Because it was just a beautiful editing. The coherency of the material was just extraordinary. And it really was about, not only was it well-made and interesting, but it was about my life. So who, who could not like it? And I want to really, I think I sent an email and I think, uh, uh, Patrick, you responded. It was really, I think, almost a work of art and, and covered so much of the history that was so important to us. Uh, and I'm, I'm less focused on the, the bad treatment than I am on the hurrahs to where we've gone, come and gone. I mean, we, we're, we're all miracles. You know, what is it Mr. Rogers always said? I did. I was too old for Mr. Rogers, but I've seen him more recently in his documentary and the, and the fiction film. We are perfect the way we are. Just, I mean, I really, it took me a long time to get there, but it's quite clear. And your film is really about that. So thank you. Well, as you can imagine that those words are incredibly, uh, gratifying and in terms of the the work that Steve did and you know in particular and the message of the film and the community so it's it means a lot and and uh, we're very grateful and I don't know if we've mentioned but the, the the film is coming to PBS actually on National Coming Out Day which is October 11th so um, we will follow up with everyone but we hope that 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 people will spread the word and you know messages like the one you just shared, Marilyn, will, will go a very long way, I think, in terms of helping other people discover the story and, and these amazing heroic activists who are at the heart of it. But thank you for, for sharing that. I just want to add that I'm not on social media, because, uh, but I have a big following. <laughs> because I've been around I don't a long doubt time. that, yes. No, <laughs> you, so, I, mean, I mean, really, I, am, I mean, your film was just a, a piece of artwork. <laughs> 
Thank well, you, I Wayne definitely Hubbard. think we need Marilyn's, uh, you know, bona fides on, on something. <laughs> yes. Just amazing. Thank you, Marilyn, for sharing. You're very um, sweet and very and supportive. Yes. You actually kind of took the, the words right out of my mouth because I'd love to know, right? We were lucky enough to get this screening with you folks. And, and I'll say if you haven't watched it and you're really just joining for the Q&A, um, you are available to watch it until Friday, the 27th. So please feel free to um, go back to the link you got in your email after you signed up. You can go to um, the website that's in the, the email and you can watch the whole thing. So if you haven't, here's your sneak peek chance. Um, and and sorry to interrupt, Christine. It's actually through Sunday. Oh, through Sunday. Sunday. So sorry. Happy weekend. Pride. You have <laughs> yes. all weekend uh -huh. to watch it. You can watch it on Friday night, have a watch party celebrate pride um but where is this going to be distributed when is it going to be distributed and when can marilyn just tell all of her friends to go watch it say it again um, well yes um the the official national premiere is coming on pbs on monday october 11th which is national coming out day and the, i will say that our partners at pbs have been so responsive and seeing the value of of having this film air on National Coming Out Day and rearrange some things within their schedule to make this happen. So it's it's um, Monday, October 11th, 10 p.m. PBS on the series Independent Lens, which is their documentary showcase within the PBS world. And we, you know, we do have some time to get the word out, um, but partners um, like like Sage and AARP are crucial to really helping us spread the word. And conversations, not on social media, just, you know, in real time are invaluable as well with friends and family and colleagues. So we're very grateful to everyone who wants to help us get the message out that it's coming to PBS. And we're happy that it's free. You don't need to pay and have passwords and, you know, yeah. subscriptions. It's free, it's accessible. And it's, um, they're saying that they expect it to reach up to 6 million viewers during the PBS window so that's pretty heartening and and um we're we're happy that that's on the horizon that's awesome well i have just my heart's full um it was such a pleasure to do this panel with you all and and hear all of your words about the making of the film and the inspirational words from the reverend goddess um i think we can all take to heart that you know we just can't give up right and that change can happen even in david versus goliath situation so thank you all again so much uh thank you arp new york for sponsoring this event as well and as a reminder uh remember you can watch till sunday you can go to your email and check it out um and i put the link to the film right in the chat if anyone you know wants to learn more information about it. Um, there's more there. And again, thank you all so much, um, Bennett, Patrick, Reverend. Um, this was one of the best uh, events I've done. So thank you. And thank, thank you, you all who's much. attending. Happy one more little quick thing, if I may throw this in there. Uh, yeah. People that are interested in getting the book, Not Another Second, uh, can call 347-343-4900. Uh, again, Not Another Second, the book. 347-343-4900. The proceeds from this book is going, uh, Watermark is taking on getting homes for uh, younger, um, pe uh, young gay people, transgendered alike, who even at this day and time as we speak are still living on the pier and it breaks my heart. And so therefore I'm pushing everybody, please get the book, go to the exhibit. The exhibit has been extended until September which is my birthday month, but that's another story. But it's extended until September. Same thing, um, Tuesdays, Thursdays, Saturdays, the exhibit is on. That phone number gives you information. Thank so you. If anyone wants to see even more of the Reverend, because there is not enough, <laughs> you can visit that link, notanothersecond.com. Um, you could view her stories and other, 11 other LGBT elders. Um, but definitely thank you, Reverend. And again, thank you, um, Patrick and Bennett. And don't forget, you can learn all about Cured at CuredDocumentary.com. So have a wonderful, wonderful day and happy Pride. Cheers. Thank you. Thanks so much. Happy Pride worldwide. <laughs> worldwide. Bye.